My name is Myrna Valerio. I'm also known as the Myrnavator, and in some circles, I am known as the original, the OG fat girl running. I am a trail runner who loves ultras, a mom of an almost 18-year-old, which I cannot believe he's still my baby, but he's also an old man. Um, I'm a former educator of 18 years, uh, an anti-racism workshop leader. In fact, um, right before I jumped onto this call, I led a three-hour workshop workshop on social justice in the outdoors for a school. I'm also a brand spanking new skier. <laughs> I'm currently obsessed. <laughs> uh, I'm a newish cyclist. I prefer gravel. And no, I am not a triathlete. Um, and y'all are really, really aggressive. I just want to say very, very aggressive. <laughs> um, and I'm also an adventurer as in a 2018 National Geographic Adventurer of the Year. I haven't been doing a whole lot of adventuring, though I did travel to Hawaii a few weeks ago to do a run shoot with my newest collaboration, um, which is with the company Lululemon. Yes, you heard right, Lululemon, right? I cannot believe my life right now. I am a black, fat, female identifying athlete with sponsorships, collaborations, a best-selling book, more partnerships in the horizons, and, and incredible, incredible projects that are still in the works. So how in the hell did I get to do this, to live a life formerly only really reserved for thin, mostly white people? It all began in 2008 um, with a health scare. I was driving from one of my gigs on the weekend. I was teaching private piano, private voice, private guitar. I don't really play, play guitar. <laughs> teaching Spanish, French, and other and composition, music arranging, all these different types of lessons. I'm, also, I'm a classically trained musician. Uh, and to my students, my former students in Maryland, and I worked during the week at a boarding school. If you know anything about boarding school, it's very, very very time consuming. It's a 24 seven operation, right? And so my stress level is up here or, or was up, well, is still <laughs> up here. And on, on the way back from one of those trips to teach all my private students, I started having pains in the left side of my chest, right? And when you have pains in the left side of your chest, what do you think is happening? You think you're having a heart attack, right? And it was very painful. So I pulled over. I had my kid in the car. He's five at the time. Um, he was zonked out in the back. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Am I going to sit here and die? Am I going to um, flag somebody down? Am I going to call 911? Am I, am I going to keep driving? What am I going to do? And so what I decided to do after a lot of deliberation and also after a lot of trying to calm myself down because I was hyperventilating, I decided to not call 911 because I didn't want to pay the ambulance bill, yay American healthcare, um, and then keep driving, which is stupid. Don't ever do that. But I kept driving. Obviously, I didn't die. <laughs> I got to my place uh, at the school because it was a boarding school. Remember, I lived there and I worked there. My colleague took me to the hospital where after eight hours, they determined that I wasn't actually having a heart attack and that I was having a panic attack panic attack. What? Black people don't have panic attacks, which is what I said to the doctor. And he says, what? Ma'am, you very obviously had a panic attack. Because I had told them all of, all of the stuff that was going on in my life. I was in grad school. I, I did this job on the weekends. I also had a kid who was sick all the time. I had a husband with a crazy, crazy schedule. Um, and I was also you know, working at this boarding school where I worked on the weekends. I didn't drive to Maryland. I was at work. I was driving kids back and forth to Walmart, to Target. I was having all my meals with them. I was, you know, and, and again, dealing with all of the all of the, the sicknesses that my son had, he had pneumonia many times. He was, he stayed in the hospital. And it's also meant that I was sick all the time, right? And I did, I did not spend any time thinking about my own health. And this is why this happened in retrospect, of course, right? And so I follow up with this cardiologist and the cardiologist looks at me after he's done all of his poking and prodding and, and said all his corny jokes, right? 
He goes, so how old is your son? I say, he's five years old. Do you want to live to see him grow up? Whoa, uh, damn, did you have to say it like that? But that was all he needed to say to me, right? That was a, a moment of catharsis where I knew that if I did not do something and refocus my life and prioritize myself, that I probably would die. Right. And so he's like, I need you to I need you to sleep more. That's the number one priority. I need you to sleep. I need you to stop working so much. I also need you to lose 15 pounds. <laughs> that was back then. And I was actually much heavier than I am now. Um, all right. And then I need you to come back in a couple of months and we'll we'll see how you're doing. So I took that advice very seriously. And the very next day, this is like August 1st of 2000. 2008, I got back on my treadmill. It wasn't the one that you see in the back, right? Um, I think that's my third treadmill. Um, but it was one that I had just purchased. And <laughs> it was also one that I had used once and then immediately proceeded to use it as a closet. I put clothes on it. There were belts on it. There were shoes on it. There was It was dusty, even though it was brand new, right? So I took a lot of stuff off. I got back on my treadmill and ran. I didn't run. <laughs> I started running, but very quickly came out of breath because I hadn't run in about three and a half years. I had always been an athlete, right? I'd, oh, I'd played field hockey in high school, lacrosse in high school. I ran all throughout college. I, I rode my bike. I swam. Um, still not a triathlete. <laughs> and uh, But I had lost this routine and being so consumed with all of the things that I was consumed with as a woman, as a mom, right? <laughs> and so um, I got back on that treadmill. My first mile was 17 minutes and 45 seconds. It was very painful. It was painful mostly emotionally and spiritually because um, I had let myself get to this point where I couldn't even run a mile. But, you know, I was like, you know, this is where I'm starting. Uh, I said on the Kelly Clarkson show, I'm starting where I'm starting. Like you start where you start. I can't look back. All I can do is be in the moment and then look ahead. Right. So, um, so that's what I did. I, I got back on a treadmill the next day, even though it was painful. It was physically painful. And then the next day, and I finally built up after a couple of weeks. I built up to five k. Right. Uh, because I knew that I needed to have a goal. So I said, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this local five k. Right. Did the local 5K, was not impressed with my time. I said, well, clearly I have to do this again. I mean, you know, you know, the endurance athlete mindset. I didn't do so well in this 45 mile race. I got to do another one so I can do better, right? So I did that. And then it just became routine for me. I did four 5Ks a week sometimes. It was very expensive <laughs> with all the t-shirts and stuff and the traveling. Um, and then I roped my friends into it. My students saw that I was out there running because remember, this is a, a boarding school. So I live where I work and I live where the students go to school. Hey, Ms. Valerio, can we can we go running with you? I became a coach. Um, I uh, Well, my friend says she, I, I bamboozled her into doing a half marathon. But I said, hey, you know, come with me for this ladies weekend down in uh, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. It was a half marathon that I had signed her up for. You know, <laughs> she was a really good sport about it. But um, I started really enjoying the training, the long miles, having to be outside for a long time. And then I did a lot of half marathons after that. And then after that, uh, a colleague said, hey, you know what? You're doing so many half marathons, you're ready for a marathon. And I was like, um, I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and she says, yes, you are. Let's sign up for the Marine Corps Marathon. This is 2011. I was like, that's a horrible idea. How do I sign up? So signed up for the marathon, fell in love with the training, also got injured. Uh, I fractured my ankle uh, the first two weeks of training, but I was able to finish training for the marathon and I did it. Um, it was physically painful. But it was so joyous. You know, after that first big race you do, it was so, so joyous. And as soon as the Marine, very hot, as soon as he <laughs> put the medal on me, um, I just broke down in tears. And I was like, oh, I got to do this again. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, throughout the entire race, I was like, why am I doing this? Why do I, why am I doing this? This is, people don't do this. <laughs> but I love it. And I fell in love and I kept doing that. I, I, I got into ultra marathoning after a race director friend says, hey, um, you need to do a 50K after he had put the medal on me for the trail marathon, my first trail marathon I ever did. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But all throughout this, I was, um, I had started my blog, Fat Girl Running, right? And, and it was a blog whose name people didn't like, um, my friends didn't like. Well, why don't you call it, why don't you call it um, Fat to Fit? I'm like, I think I'm pretty fit. Um, even though I'm still fat, I'm, I, I, can, I can swim a mile, I can, I can ride my bike for hours. I can run for hours. I can play tennis. I think I'm pretty fit. Well, why don't you just call it like um, girl running? <laughs> no, I'm, I am fat, even though I, at this point I had lost about 70 pounds, right? Um, and, but I was like, still fat. So I continued to call my blog Fat Girl Running. I wrote about the stories of how I, um, how I saw myself in a world of mostly thinner athletes in endurance sports, right? I told stories about all the great things that people would say to me, all the encouragement I got. And I also told stories about how people would look at me and say, why don't you just go on a diet? Stop eating. Why don't you uh, play tennis instead? It's, it's better for your knees. Have you played tennis before? <laughs> Running is bad for your knees. Always said by non-runners. Always, always. You know, you don't belong out here. People would look at me and like, be surprised. Or they would say, you know, when I, uh, when I was at a marathon, they would say, oh, uh, are you doing the 5K fun run? Which is fine, there's nothing wrong with a 5K fun run, I'm here for the marathon. And once one guy, um, while I was training for three marathons, I was out in Van Cortland Park in the Bronx and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, running slowly. I, I was probably struggling because it was really hot. And he's, he's running and he's walking in the other direction. He's like, hey, sis, you would lose more weight more quickly if you walked. I'm like, brother man, brother man. I'm training for three marathons. He's like, oh, my bad. Um, so I wrote about those things. Um, you know, every now and then I moved down to Georgia after I was in New Jersey, um, continued to write some things. And then somehow Wall Street Journal gets wind of my blog. And I get an email from Rachel Bachman, who is one of their sports re reporters, and she's amazing. She goes, hey, would you, can I interview you about being, uh, being a, an athlete who is not athleting to lose weight? Um, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's my jam. So that article comes out. This is 2015 now. A couple of weeks later, because there was so much, so, so much commentary around the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal article, Runner's World says, hey, can we can we feature you? Me? Like you want me? Like, did you know I'm fat? Because <laughs> I don't see fat people in Runner's World unless it's a weight loss story or before and after. I was like, nah, that's not my story, right? Although there were there was some weight loss, but that's not how I identify, and that's not how I wanted to be seen in the world. And so they did a 12-page feature. My mom counted the pages. <laughs> and then subsequently bought all of the magazines in the entire city of New York um, when it came out, that changed my life, right? Then NBC Nightly News came, and it was all this story about here's this woman who is plus size or curvy or, or self-identifying as fat, doing long distance races, doing any races, right? And, um, and it was like, to, still to some people, it is mind-blowing to see somebody like me running a race, right? And so I had a book deal out of it. I was on CNN a couple of times. The REI video um, came out. That went viral. And so like my life was like completely um, turned around. And I was able to actually leave teaching because um, <laughs> I got this gig to do a commercial for JCPenney. I remember JCPenney, do they even still exist? <laughs> and I made a quarter of my salary in seven hours shooting a commercial. And I said, this is what people do. Oh my God. And that wasn't the only sort of catalyst for um, changing my job. But I was like, this is an, an incredible opportunity 
to like be a sponsored athlete. That's like really non-traditional <laughs> sponsored athlete because I was getting sponsorships from all these companies. And so I left my job teaching. And so like I, I get to do all these incredible things, right? I get to to go to Morocco to run the first stage of the, the Marathon des Sables, right? Hey, do you want to come over and like do some social media and, and run? You can run the entire race, so you can run the first day, right? Um, I I trained Will Smith for his first half marathon. They called me to train him for his first half marathon, and that's a whole other story unto itself. Maybe one day I'll tell it. <laughs> Uh, I get invited to places like the Azores to run their legendary trail races. I get profiled by a lot of various by various news outlets, um, which really gets that message out that you can be an athlete in whatever body you have. Right. You matter. You belong. And then Vermont <laughs> thinks I've been in a lot of news outlets in Vermont. And so Vermont thinks I'm the only black person here. So they like give me all the work, right? <laughs> That's only half false. Um, and, and I got to be on the cover of Women's Running Magazine. And guess what? I was wearing Nicole de Boom's stuff, <laughs> skirt sports. Hi, Nicole. I see you um, on that cover. And so I want to talk, talk a little bit about that, that whole experience of of meeting with a photographer and 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 being on the cover, right? Because it was so so cool. Um, I even though I lived in Georgia at the time, I would spend summers with my mom uh, and my mother's stepfather and brother in Brooklyn. And so I was in Brooklyn, and I decided that I would take my mom to this photo shoot, right? Uh, because she was just so beside herself. Her daughter was going to be on the cover of a running magazine, a running magazine, right? So she was so excited. So we we get to this park called Harriman State Park in upstate New York. We meet the photographer, James Farrell, who is phenomenal, right? And, you know, we're shooting here. We're shooting there. Mom's doing my hair and doing my makeup and, and stuff. We're having a great time. And so James, who had, you know, scouted different spots in the park, says, okay, so now we're going to go down this trail. Um, we're going to go down this trail and we're going to go up this hill. And I was like, okay, mom, well, why don't you just hang out in the car, hang out in the car, you know, put, you know, blast the AC because we're going to like go walk up this hill. And she goes, well, I want to go too. I was like, mom, no, no, like stay in the car. My mother walks with a cane, right? She walks with the cane. She's had mobility issues for a long time. So I'm like, mom, just stay in the car. She's like, I'm going with you. And I'm like, okay, mom has spoken. I am not, I'm just going to listen to my mom because <laughs> that would be punished afterwards. And so she comes with us. I look at this hill and gosh, it's a steep hill. <sighs> mom, do you, are you sure? Why don't you just like hang out? She's like, I got it. You got you two. And she's like directing <laughs> me and the photographer, you two go ahead. I got it. Right. So she takes my trekking poles and she, uh, she climbs up the hill. Right. I don't think she's going to make it. We're up there. We're already like almost done with our photo shoot up there. And it's in it. And it's this beautiful vista um, of the rest of Harriman Park. It's like emerald green. The sky is a bluebird blue. There are yellow wildflowers everywhere. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish my mom could see this. So I turn around and who is at the top of this hill? Looking all proud of herself and amazing and tired. She got, I made it. Right. And then in that moment, I was like, oh, who am I? Who am I to determine what a person can or cannot do? Even my mom. I did the same thing to my mom that people do to me. They look at me. They think I can't do something. They think I don't belong. And I did that same thing to my mom. Right. Not cool. Not cool. So <laughs> it was just such a special moment because then I realized that this is why I do what I do. I want to show people that even if somebody else thinks you can do it, even if that person is your own daughter who speaks about this stuff, you can actually do it or you can at least try. You can do the work to get there, right? <laughs> the other reason... Um, the other thing that I that I get to do um, that also has to do with my mom is uh, moms are amazing. I just want to say that um, is that like once I 
not just once, uh, every year since 2017, I've had the opportunity to go out to Trans Rockies, which is a six day stage race in Colorado. Right, it's 120 miles total over six days. You're in the Rockies. You start at about 8,000 feet of altitude, go up to 12,600 feet, and you uh, you're, you're doing all this. Like some of the running, running is technical. It's a lot of hiking, um, and so I signed up for this race. Actually, I got invited, which was really really cool because it had been on my fitness bucket list for a long time. Right. And so I put it out into the universe and it came right back to me. So I fly into Denver the day before the race starts. See where this is going? Nice. Nice. <laughs> Not good. The first day is about 21 and a half miles from Buena Vista. Uh, it's with, like within Buena Vista. And there's like incredible high desert, incredible views of the collegiate peaks. It's amazing. It's hard, but I crush it. Right. I'm like, I got this because I eat 20 miles for breakfast. What? I got it. Right. And so I'm like feeling really good for the next day. The next day starts in Vicksburg. Right. Which is which is at 9000 feet. Right. Um, I'm feeling good. There's a false flat the first two miles, but it's still pretty flat. And then you hang a right and then you start ascending up to Hope Pass. And at this point, I was like, I don't got it <laughs> because it's like thirty five hundred feet of climb. And um, and, you know, you're you're increasingly getting up into the higher altitudes. And I didn't know that I was starting to have altitude sickness, but I'm like, I'm going really slow. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm moving. The sweeps are right behind me. I was last. They're like, you got it, girl. You got it. Yeah. Way to go. Just keep moving. Um, I was taking really long, but I got to the top, right? I was feeling really, really woozy, but I got to the top. You know how like when you're at altitude, you feel like you're moving really fast, but you're actually not, All right? That's how it was. But I got to the top. We got there before the thunderstorms and the, the, you know, the, Typical afternoon storms happen. And uh, I'm looking at all the views. It's amazing. I'm feeling really good. And then I, you know, we bomb down to the bottom where the, the trails uh, take us to Twin Lakes in Leadville like, or near, near Leadville. Right. And so when we get to the bottom, it's about five or so miles, we get to the bottom. There's a medic waiting for me. His name is Barrett. Remember this name, Barrett. Right. I'm feeling good. The sweeps are feeling good, right? And uh, he goes, hey, Myrna, how you doing? Right, because he knew it was me because I was the last person, right? You know, they're all in walkie-talkie. I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling great. I am ready to finish this last five miles, ready to go. He's like, yeah, about that. Well, you're two hours behind everybody else. So um, I'm going to give you a choice. You can continue on and make everybody wait. So they really have to take down the finish line, or you can come out with me and walk to um, walk to this trailhead, and we'll get picked up. I'm thinking about it for a couple of seconds. I'm like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Started feeling bad about wait, making people wait. Yeah, I'm slow. I know I'm slow, but I, like I trained so much for this, but I don't want people to wait for me. So I called it. And immediately regretted it, of course. And so I <laughs> said to the sweeps, thank you so much. And I'm like, no, 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 we got you. Like, we'll make sure you get to, to the end. We'll make sure to do whatever we need to do. And I was like, no, it's okay. I don't want to in inconvenience anyone. And so they're like, you sure? Yeah. So I go out with Barrett and I am so mad. I start ugly crying and I'm not a big crier, but I started ugly crying and I was Mad, I was mad at Barrett. He kept talking too much. He kept saying, oh, we're on this trail. We're supposed to be on this trail together. We're supposed to have this conversation. You know, this can be a, be a transformative experience for us. And I was like, fuck transformation. I'm mad at you. I was mad at my feet. I was mad at the sky, right? But as we're walking, also he, t he had told me that the trail was flat. Never believe Anybody that lives on mountains, in mountains, or around mountains, never believe when they say that the trail is flat because of course the trail isn't flat. It went up the entire time uh, and it was very, very technical. And I was just mad, I was mad, I was tripping everywhere. But then as we walked, you know, I answered his questions because I am very courteous, even though I was like cursing him out of my head. I started to make peace with it. I was like, you know what? I did, I got to do, however many, like five or six miles. 
like, and I, and I made it up and over Hope Pass. I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay. And we're walking. I made peace with myself. We're walking. I started listening to the birds, started actually talking to him and not just like responding. Um, and I get, we get to the trailhead, right? And, and our, our ride isn't there yet. So I sit down on a rock and I start getting in my head again. I start crying again. <laughs> Ugly crying. <laughs> And then my phone pinged, right? I hadn't had service the entire time, but that minute, that moment, I got a ping. Who is it? It's my mom. Hey, honey, hope you're having a good day on your race. It sounds crazy. I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, and then there's a picture of her at the gym on the treadmill that she had sent, right? And she had never been on a treadmill by, like, at the gym by herself, right? Unless I took her and I had only taken her twice. She's like, oh, I'm so happy. I, I did the I did the 25 minutes on the treadmill you told me to do. And I did the 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 10 minutes on the elliptical. It's so weird. It feels so weird. Uh, and then I did the five minutes on the stupid stair thing just because you told me to do it, right? And she's a picture of her herself and she's smiling. She's like, God willing, I can do this again on Friday. And that was it. I was like, I'm okay. I'm fine. Barrett, I'm okay. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine because if me doing crazy stuff like this and introducing her to a gym and 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 seeing her climb this hill that she that I thought she wasn't going to be able to climb if that's what this meant then I'm doing my job right this is why I get to do what I do right um, I get to do these incredible things and go to incredible spaces, not just to live out all of my athletic dreams, but to allow others to see what is possible, what's out there. And yes, they can do it too. So I go out and even though I might win things, hell, I'm always last. <laughs> and I, sometimes I don't even finish, but I do hard shit. I think we're all entitled to do hard shit. And we all know that when we push ourselves beyond our preconceived notions of what others can do and then what we are able to do, the whole world opens up to us and we open ourselves up to the world. And that is what I think being feisty is about. I think it's about saying screw you to all the people that think folks like me don't belong in athletic spaces formally reserved for thin people. It's about saying fuck you to the NCAA and their extremely overt sexism and low expectations of premium female athletes. It's about saying yes you can to your mom as she climbs the steepest hill that she has ever climbed. It is about welcoming and embracing those unlikely folks into our athletic communities. And it is about a company like Lululemon finally realizing that athletes like me want pretty, functional, high performance, and expensive as clothes too, right? And it's finally about sending a clear message to the world, just like I said it off the record, off the record, to Nat Geo, but then it ended up in the actual article. I like to stick my big black ass into spaces where people think I don't belong. So folks, stick your ass, whether it's black and big or not, into all of the spaces. You belong. We belong. We are entitled to it all. We are entitled to all the things that make us incredible athletes and incredible humans. We have the right. We deserve greatness, whether it is cultivating our own or others, wherever and however that greatness resides. So go forth and be great, my friends. Live and embody that feisty spiciness we all call upon when we're doing those stupid fucking hill repeats. <laughs> we got this. We've always had it. Thank you.